Welcome to Module 13 of a course called Coding for Crosswords. If you want information on the full course, please see the links below. In the last module, it was a big module, we developed uh, uh, the whole idea of the pattern hash. Uh, in this module, we'll take on something easier. We'll get back to working with the grid. And there are two data structures that we want to develop for this. One is called point and one is called span. So let me explain what those are. Let's go back to the problem statement here. This is the problem we're working on in this class. Um, and what we're working with is a grid that will number the rows from zero to seven like this. And being computer engineers, we start with zero and then we'll number the columns also. These are hard to see because of the black, but uh, We'll number the columns like this uh, from zero to six also. So there's seven rows and seven columns. We need a way to identify a particular square on the board. A nice way to do that is to just use this pair, which is going to be row, column. Now, why do I start up here? If you take a math class, you'd start with the origin down at this point. But um, crossword puzzles tend to start from the upper left. All the numbering of the clues works this way and the way that humans usually solve them works this way. So the whole notion of a crossword puzzle tends to like to have the origin up here. Just there are things that end up being more natural if we number the crossword that way. So that's why we start up in this corner. And why do we do row first instead of, instead of column first? Because this, you could think of this as the X dimension and this the Y. And that is arbitrary. That's also because you tend to think about a crossword puzzle being laid out almost like the way they used to do screen rasters and they'd print a screen, you'd go across each row like this. And so having the row as the major index and the column as a secondary index is arbitrary, but it lets us um, find things that are horizontal a little more easily because they're the minor index will be incrementing for the horizontal, um, for the horizontal spans. So we're gonna define two concepts with regard to one of these grids like this. One is a point. Let's say we want to identify this square on the graph. I'm going to call that, I'm going to call that a point. Let me, let me actually look here. I'll take, this is a better description, better generic crossword blank. You can print these out. These are on the, on the web. Everybody, you can find these on Google images or anything. It's from zero to, well, zero to 14 or one to 15. Um, our puzzle is only going to go up to here, right? So our puzzle is really only this, only, only this big. So we'll just be really concerned with the puzzle that's right now that's seven by seven. So let's pick a point like this that we want to look at. How do you identify that point? We're going to call that point, point. We're going to have a data structure called point, and that is going to be called what? We're going to call that point two one. That is going to identify that square. So we need the data structure to show that. And at this point now, this should be more comfortable for you to, to work on that. So let's bring up the code that we have here and I will show you how we add that. Um, it's going to be a base data structure. We can put it here at the very start of our file and I can do it like this. Like I said before, I tend to do uh, this kind of syntax just for the formatting. It's going to be a struct instead of a class because it's going to be a very simple object with just a couple of fields, the row and the column. So here we go, struct point. That's all we do, and then we add the semicolon there. So we're gonna take a lot after this. Here's the word right below it. We're gonna take a lot of ideas from this. We're going to have a constructor for the point. Now, what do you what do you think you might wanna give a point when you create it? Well, maybe we want a blank point with nothing. Um, that, I believe that is a placeholder for now. And maybe we want a point where you actually give it a row and a column. And in that case, we want to initialize our private data in here, okay? And then here's the guts of the constructor. Let's talk about what data should this have. It really has just two things. One of the ints is a row, and one of the ints is a column. That's really it. So we're, instead of having a, a, a word with a string in it like we did down here, we're going to just say a point is simply a row and a column. Um, and that's really it. So to construct a point with an R and a C that you give it, we're going to use this syntax here which is to initialize the row to R and the column to C. Okay, so that's going to initialize, if you call this constructor, will you give it a row and a column, um, it will initialize the row and column data structures here to the values that you're giving it. 
Now, if you don't initialize anything, we want to give that a default value. And the best way to do default values is down here. This is the preferred way because then if you build other constructors later, um, you you won't forget them. Because one option would be to put it in here. You could say, well, let's put maybe zero. If they forget to give you, or if they don't want to give you what the wrong column is when they construct the point, you can set it to zero. So that's this is one legitimate way to do it. But a better way really is to put those values here because then they apply all the time for any constructor. And that's a way to guarantee that something won't be uninitialized. Because uninitialized data is, um, is really bad in your program and you want to avoid all cases of, of having that. Um, and there are other tools that can check for that. So you can always check to see if you, if you end up with that case. Um, so that's our point structure. So uh, let's go down to main. So I'll go to the bottom of the file and I'm going to remove some of this stuff we did last time. Remember we did this read from file business. We're going to just get rid of that. We're going to go back and put this stuff back in again now. Um, and then let's, um, let's make a point. So here's our first point. Let's just make one. Let's make, make it P1 like that. And let's make it P2 where we give it, you know, two comma one. Those are our two points that we're going to make. So let's compile that and see how we do. And that's as always, it's, it's, it's uh, our normal command line here. And that compiles and it runs. And um, if you remember, we take a long time now to read the library. Um, this sometimes is something that you just have to deal with. Um, other times, it's kind of in the way and we don't need that much. So there's one trick I thought of we can do for our case. And let's go back and do that. We are reading the library from a file right here. This is all part of the library class. So um, if you scroll up here, you'll see this is all library. So this is the library class and we read from the file here and then we put everything into our pattern hash, create pattern hash. Um, we're hashing every word in the library, no matter how long that word is. Now it turns out we don't really need to do that. We're only doing a seven by seven crossword puzzle right now. So just as a hack, let's do this. Let's say create pattern hash. Let's check the length of the word that we're creating the pattern hash for. Here's the first challenge. If that length is greater than seven, let's not create the pattern hash. So code that, code some lines in there that will tell the computer to say, if it's a too long a word that we don't care about, let's not even pattern hash it. That will speed up that whole step at the start uh, by quite a bit. Okay, welcome back. That code looks something like this. If length is greater than seven, and we can just for now hard code that. This kind of seven is not good to have in general, but for now it's, it's fine. Uh, we could later, make that be something smarter like maybe it, when it reads the grid it detects the size of the grid and then it only generates the library words that you'll need for that grid you know that's a good way to do it but for now we'll leave it like this if length is greater than seven um we can say return we can just return earlier right there it's it's not that bad a design pattern sometimes that can be a little bit of trouble if there's some other code you know maybe there's some code in here that does some stuff and then there's some code down here that does some stuff to maybe like clean up things that this code did or to kind of, uh, you know, compensate for something this did. If you return right in the middle of that, sometimes the person who wrote this code, assuming this code will run later, might get confused because this code will run and then you return in some cases. So, so this design pattern is a little bit, is a little bit uh, dangerous maybe, but it's not bad, it's not bad. Um, it, equivalent to this, you could also, you could write it the other way. You could say, if the length is less than or equal to seven, then, then do everything inside. And you can go through the entire routine then and indent all of this stuff, right? And you can put it like that. So that's also fine too. Um, to me, you know, that's that's a lot of extra indent in here. I kind of prefer the other way where you just handle the corner cases and then return. So if it's greater than seven, we'll just return and get out of here. Um, and there shouldn't be any problem with that. It's just not gonna put any of the, it won't do all this, this pattern. And that's because the number of patterns grows exponentially with the length of the word, this will cut our processing time for the library down to almost nothing. Here, let's test and see if that's true or not. So let's go back to the compile window and let's see if, first of all, if that compiles, which it does, and then now we'll run it and it just goes almost right away. So that reduced our library pre-processing overhead down, um, down quite a lot. And as I mentioned before, there's a, I'll do an advanced module later about how to multi-thread. If you really do need, when you get larger libraries and larger grids, when you need those, all that extra library work, you can multi-thread it. A lot of computers these days have four processors, I mean four thread, you know, four CPU threads or eight or even 16, or this computer has 32. So I can multi-thread the, 
the library program. And it sounds kind of complicated, but it's not that hard. It's just dividing the work up into 32 different buckets. And then you turn the multiple computers inside your computer to work on that. And then you're going to speed it up by almost a factor of 32 in this case, because the work is very separable. So multi-threading is a concept that's, um, that's quite powerful and very standard, but um, that, I'll leave that for the advanced portion of this course. So we are now ready to take our points and print them. Now here's the thing, how do you print the point, right? You'd like to be able to say point one is, and then what we'd like to be able to do really is just this, P1. We'd just like to print it, right? Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be cool if you could just take the point, the object, and just print it and have it print something sensible, like maybe like in parentheses it'll print the row in the column. So let's try to compile that and I'll show you what happens. It should fail because it doesn't know, it gives you all these problems with, um, with wow, these are also, <laughs> these are really tough errors, oh my God. Um, but here basically it says no match for operator uh, less than less than. Since this is the operator that's been overloaded for the, for the, for the printing, it's really a, a, a bit shift operator, but they, they overload it for printing um, just because it looks kind of neat. It looks like a redirect operator kind of visually. Um, we can also add that to our point class. And um, so let's see how to do that. So that's something you can skip this. If this, is, if this looks too crazy to you, uh, you really don't need to know this. This is operator overloading for printing. And it's, it's a kind of a corner case. I'll just do it and you can see how it works up. Uh, don't, the syntax gets kind of ugly here. So don't worry too much if this is, um, if this is hard to understand. There's a good example on the web. If you just type in, there's a lot of good examples, but if you just type in um, how to overload operator less than less than, um, it should give you a bunch of answers. Um, one of them is actually this Microsoft answer. I think that's a good one. Um, and here's the code right here. Here's kind of what we're doing. They have a structure called date. We have one called point, um, and then they just print it like that, just, just, like, just like we did for our point. And here's how it works. What you do is inside the class, you're gonna define this thing, okay? So we're gonna do that same thing over in our class. So let's just cut and paste that. Let's go back over to our window here, and let's go back up to where point is, and let's add that. Let's add in here just what they said there. There we go. It is a O stream, it's a class that returns an output stream. And this is the name of the operator that we're overloading. So when you when you take a point and you use that operator, it'll call this function. Um, and then it takes, this is just the way this is set up. It takes an, an output stream reference as the first argument and it takes a const and then we, we're not doing date, we're doing point, right? And we can just call it P, right? So what we can do is we can go down here, uh, just like if you go back to their example down here, they define this, let's just cut and paste this one. Okay, so here we go. They, ah, I see they used a different indenting style. I'll just fix it to my style. And then we're going to say now, here is this function. Um, and let's fix it to not take a date, but to take a uh, point. And what do we want to actually print? We want to print, we don't need a month and a date and all this stuff. We really just want something simple. We really just want the parenthesis Let's do a parenthesis. Let's print. Let's print the row. Let's print the other parenthesis. We, we could use single quotes here, but double is double is. It's just what I'm used to. And then we could print the column. Okay, now look at that and see what that looks like. When we call the print operator, this 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 bit shift operator on the point, it's going to do nothing except for just to print the row. Oh, we want to actually. Oh wait, that was totally wrong. We want to put the row and then we want to put a comma and then we want to put the column and then another parentheses. Now, do we want a line feed here? And the answer is probably not because you want to be able to print multiple points per line. The print of the point itself shouldn't really have a line feed in it. Um, you should let the person who's calling the point print decide whether they want to do a line feed or not. So let's leave the line feed off for now and leave it just like that. Okay, so now we're gonna go try to recompile this code and let's see if it works. It compiles and now when it prints, it says, and we've done this other, um, we're just printing this stuff out from the, the file parsing and then the grid print. Um, down here, you can see it says, yes, point one is zero, zero. Okay, good. Let's go back to see what we're doing here. We said point one is zero, zero, but what about point two? At point two, we wanted to do, we wanted to have initialized to two to two one. So let's check that one. We'll run that again, and we'll see that that indeed gives us 2, 1. Okay, so 
that's pretty much the first part of this lesson. Um, it's just defining another data object point, which we're going to use shortly. Um, and then it defines a way to print it. Um, later, we're going to define some other things on it, um, how to manipulate it. Maybe we want to take two points and add them together. So that's going to be another operator overload. We're going to overload the operator plus for the point class. But for now, let's move to the next topic, which is the idea of a span. So let's go back to this picture here of the point. There's another concept we want, which is a group of boxes that are linked together to make a span. Like this could be a span. And you can see where we're going to go with this. This is going to be where there's going to be a word like dog in it. So the span we want to have, how do you define a span? There's the starting point for it, right? So there's a, there's a point. And then there's what else? There's a, there's a length of the span. There's a length. And there's also whether or not it runs vertical or horizontal. So this is a dog running vertical. So that's a bool. So a span is going to have three things. The starting point, its length, and then horizontal or vertical Boolean. And how many spans would this grid, our, our grid, have? Um, you can see already this is going to be one span. This is going to be one. This is going to be one. This is going to be one. This long seven, seven letter one. That's going to be our longest one and the most interesting one for finding answers. A four and then a three and then a three again. Notice that this span, the dog, and then this span, the cat, are fully completed. Those are already done. So we don't need to do any more work on those spans. These spans are fully empty. Now the vertical spans are more interesting. They've got, um, in general, this one has four letters vertical and it starts with a D and then it has some blank squares. So the vertical spans are have part of the work done. Here the one in the middle has no work done. Then this one also has part of the work done, part of the work done, part of the work done. Okay, so out of the 14 spans that you see here, seven vertical and seven horizontal, um, two of them are done. You know, they have full words in them, dog and cat. Um, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six of them, six of them are what I'm gonna call partially done. They have a seed letter, but other letters blank. And then how many others? One, two, three, four, five, and then six of them um, are completely empty. And that should add to 14. So that's, we want the computer to now eventually find these, but the basic data structure we're working with in this, in this lecture is this thing called a span, which defines this thing. So let's get back to the code and write what the span is. So let's go back up to where point is and let's, um, actually for a different change, let's try a different design style. You know, the way I did point was I coded the class first, the struct first, and then I used it. A different design style is like a use first design style where you say, let me use it first. So let's say, what do, how do we want to use a span? Let's say we define these things first. And then um, actually let's take out this print just to make sure that it, uh, let's make this a little less noisy. The load from file, I think we're printing out every line. Let's, let's go ahead and remove that. So, so now when things print, when we run the program, we won't print so much. We'll just print what we want to down here. Let's make a span. We'll call it S1. And maybe we want to start it at point one and we want to have it go for three boxes long and we want to have it be vertical. I'll just say true for vertical. Um, and then span two, we're going to say start at point two maybe. We're going to have it be five long and we're going to have it be horizontal just for sake of printing that out. So that's the kind of model we want for our constructors. We can go back up to the point now and we can use that so here's kind of the way we want to call a span. Um, and so we'll do all the boilerplate stuff here. The, 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 the name of the span, we'll do struct span. Whoops, struct span, we'll do the, uh, these are the constructors, right? That we're kind of starting to think about how to make them into actual constructors. We don't need the, uh, we don't need the name here, right? It's just gonna be span. This is gonna be a point. Um, you can either do this as a const reference or as a, or as just passing the point. The point's so small that it's actually funny in a 64 bit machine, the actual point data itself is smaller than a pointer to it. So you can just pass the, the, the pointer itself. There'll be a, a length and there'll be a thing called V for vert. So here's going to be the data in this structure. It's going to be, it's going to be a point. We can call it point. There's going to be a length. We can call it L E N. It's just a common abbreviation that's pretty well understood. And we can say vert. Oh, but it's not an int. 
it's going to be a bool. Oh man. Okay, so that's the that's the span object um, that we want to create. Here's the constructor for it. Do we want to allow a span to be created with no point in it? Uh, and I would say no. Let's leave that off until we need it because creating a span that has not been initialized yet, you could set everything to zero, but it doesn't really have a lot of sense, right? So I don't I don't anticipate a use case for that. So let's wait until we need it before we actually go and code that. Um, so let's go down and see how we're using that thing. Um, like we said, we're doing spans. Um, let's try to compile this and just make sure we're compiling okay because we haven't done anything yet to print the span. Um, oh, this is good. So it didn't actually like this. Um, oh, oh, I didn't. Ah, okay, this is, ah, this is a good bug. Undefined reference. So I decide, I declared this function would exist somewhere. But if we go back and look at the code for span, um, ah, look at what I did. It's a bit of a mini challenge. Can you see what the problem is? There's two ways to, de to define a function in, in C++. You can put the, the declaration like this, like we did for this operator up here. You can put the declaration in here and you can put a semicolon and just say, hey, sometime later I'm gonna define this. Um, and then you can, and then down here later, scoped, scope to the scope of span, you can, you can declare that thing. Um, but um, um, we're not doing that. Instead, I wanted to, I had intended to put the definition here. So because I didn't put the definition in, it complained that it had no definition. So that's what caused this error here. So now that I fixed that, let's um, give that a try again. And that compiles okay. And it doesn't really do much yet. We read words from the library and here's our two points. Let's do the same thing for the printing. So let's do also, let's do this. Let's just do the same thing. Let's say span blah is, and then span s1 is, span s2 is. Let's make these s's. Okay, so that's the print. So now here's your challenge. Go to the, look at this example from the point class and write the same type of operator to print the span. So that's your challenge. Go give that a, go give that a try. Try to write these same two functions that we wrote for the point class. Try to go write them for the span class. See how you want to print that out. Okay, go. Cool. Okay, welcome back. That should have been easy, I hope. You just kind of copy the same idea. So here we go. It's going to be operator and instead of a point now we're going to be giving it a span and we can call it s if we want and then we're going to copy these things down here and we're going to do an operator that's going to print a span now what do we want to print i think it could be i mean you, you can decide what you want maybe a bracket and then we're going to print the point itself which prints everything about the point that's all fine then we're going to put as another as another thing after the parentheses, the point will print the parentheses. After that, um, yeah, let's put the let's put the end like this. After that, we could print um, um, length equals length and um, space vert equals vert. So there's no right answer. It's just you want to print these things out. So here's. Here's the print. You want to say you start with a bracket, print the point, then print length equals length, and then space vert equals vert. So that should compile. Let's see if we did that right. Um, oh, and I put the p. Ah, yeah, right. So it's not it's not p anymore. There's no p available. What p do we trying to print? We're trying to print the spans point, right? So it's the s. It's s dot dot point, and it's not just length. We don't have a length. It's s dot length. And it's and it's s dot vert. So those are the three mistakes I made here that correspond with these three errors. So if we clean that up, you can see that this prints. Um, so there you go. Oh, haha! And this is another great error. So I caught another bug in this. <laughs> Why are these so crazy? What did we do wrong? This is a mini challenge. I'll pretend I intended to do this, <laughs> but this was actually an accident. <laughs> okay, so go back up to the code for the constructor. Right here's the constructor code. It takes a point, it takes, uh, it takes a length, and it takes a bool. Now the point has its own constructor, so it'll build itself as a zero, zero. But look at what I did. I didn't even use those two. I didn't use them at all. So I totally forgot to inst instantiate, uh, uh, to, to initialize the values. So vert has to get L. So vert, vert has, sorry, length has to get L and vert has to get V out of these lists of arguments. Okay, so that should compile now. So let's give that a try and let's run that. 
and we got it. So now you can see one of these spans starts at zero, zero um, and goes three, one. Oh yeah, I wanted that to be, what did I do there, 0 0.2. Oh, this is a good bug too, because this is zero, zero going length three vert is, is positive. And then the second one, um, oh, we didn't pass in the point. Ah, so a second initialization bug. And again, I can pretend I intended this. Um, look at what we did. We passed this point here. It doesn't go anywhere. We didn't initialize it. What we really have to do is initialize the point too, of course. So this point needs to be initialized with with P, otherwise it's ignoring the P and it's setting it to zero. Okay, so that should get the final answer. So let's compile it again and let's run it. And there we go. There's our, there's the one span that starts at zero, is three long vertical. The other one starts at two, one, is five and, and is vert zero. So we're gonna stop there for this lecture. I promise this was an easy lecture. I hope that gets you back um, into coding and feeling like um, you understand that we're going to use both this point and the span in the next lecture when we're going to Take a grid, our grid that we've loaded, and we're gonna have a routine that finds all the spans in that grid. It's gonna walk all the rows and columns and look for the adjacent boxes and try to give us a vector back, a collection back of all the available spans. And then we can start to say, hey, which spans are done? Which spans need some work? And we're gonna to start to peel off the ones that need work and we're gonna to start to call that pattern hash to find all the choices. So you can see how this is coming together now, I hope. We're gonna we're gonna read the grid, find what work needs to be done, call our library with all the possible words that might fit in each of those. And so the last piece that's gonna be the fun part is putting that all together into a recursion routine that will try all the possible words in all the possible slots. And you'll see the power of programming when we do that. So I hope to see you in the next lecture for that.